couple seconds. Yes. All right, Paul Weiler. Guys, I'm Paul, I'm Van Ash, and this is I Am the Hero. I Am the Hero is a fully immersive, motion captured, virtual reality experience, unlike anything anybody has ever done before. To make this game, we're using two unique, awesome pieces of tech. One, our mocap studio. That's where you play the game. Van Ash is dressed up, ready to go. And two, <laughs> We're using the upcoming Oculus Rift virtual reality headset. And what happens when we put these two pieces of tech together is that every move you make in the, in the mocap studio translates directly into the game. If you move your arm, if you wave it around in front of you, you're going you're gonna to be doing that in the game world. You can look down at yourself and see your, your virtual character covered in awesome armor and equipment. And if we, uh, if we take some equipment like this, uh, Nerf sword, flimsy shield, <laughs> you can wield those in the game world, and they will be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> now, does this tech sound like a tall order? Maybe, but it's not. Getting mocap data into UDK is not a problem. We have, so we have solved that. And unfortunately, we don't have a, a demo for it because we got it done this morning. <laughs> but we will be happy to show you how that works later on. And uh, the Oculus Rift. Now, some of you may not have heard about this. It's a uh, cutting edge piece of virtual reality tech. And we've got a little video to show you how that, how that works. The magic that sets the Rift apart is immersive stereoscopic 3D rendering, a massive field view, and ultra low latency head tracking. Doug Carmack is one of the best developers in the world. The Doom, Quake, Commander Keen. Carmack saw some of my work. That's originally when he reached out to me. For a certain segment of the population, the hacker favorite crowd, this is going to be awesome and cool to work on. I also think the best VR network will probably be one of the first seen. And here's an example of what that looks like with the responsive head tracking. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> and as an added bonus, it comes with support for UDK right out of the box. Now, unfortunately, we have, we have a bit of a, a snag here. Because there was such high demand for this piece of equipment, we're not going to be able to get one until the day. Luckily, we have an alternative in the meantime. This here is the Musix VR920 virtual reality headset. And we have that right here by. So we can plug this thing in, and we can get going building this game immediately and switch over to the Rift when it becomes available for us. So what are you going to be seeing and doing in this fully immersive virtual environment? Well, we went for a, a low fantasy theme, much akin to Skyrim. But we really wanted to make the color a lot more vivid, really make the world pop. So we got some bright colors, made it a little more painterly, really got some exaggerated shapes and forms. We have five environments in I Am the Hero. The first and most important one is the tavern. This is where you start your story. Now in this tavern, you are the hero because you have saved the town from four terrible menaces and trophies of your victories adorn the walls. As a matter of fact, the bard in the tavern sings your praises in verse, and he will continue to do so throughout your adventure, narrating your every action. So from these trophies, you can simply approach them and will and we'll teleport you via flashback into the battle at which you are in. And you can see a couple of these environments that we're going to be putting you in right up here. So what are you going to be doing in these environments? You're going to be fighting monsters. We have four battles. The first 
in a dark graveyard, you will be hacking down hordes of skeletons and a fearsome death knight. You may have to use such uh, virtual reality tricks as kicking over virtual gravestones or summoning stones in order to stop the skeletal horde. Second, on the uh, windy plains, you'll be facing off against a fearsome centaur. Here, you'll have to avoid his charges and leave your sword in his path to cut him down to size. On the slope of a snowy mountain, you'll face a terrifying, fire-breathing dragon. Using your shield to block his fireballs and breath, you'll use your sword to strike just when the moment's right. And last, culminating in everything that you've learned, you will face at the top of a dark and terrifying tower, the Beholder. And we'll see him in a minute. Here's a, here's a look at what your weapons might look like in the game world. Obviously, they're not going to look like that. But when you see them, they're going to look something like that. So when you're fighting, there's more to it than hack and slash, though. You're going to have to be worrying about where you're standing, where you're moving where the enemy is, how he's reacting to you. And I think this piece of art here really <coughs> exemplifies the design challenges and objectives of I Am Hero. As you can see, we've got this uh, kind of small tower. People don't normally walk up towers, so we're going to assume you're not going to try to do that in the game room. Whereas if you did, you may eventually walk into a wall in the mocap studio. We have a, a laser that this guy is firing at. You can move out of the way, you can block it with your shield. And as you see, he's uh, hovering in the air a little bit, so he's going to be able to move around and react to where you are, and either keep you at a distance or try to charge you close, depending on what the situation calls for. There are a couple of other little uh, tricks we wanted to incorporate here. For, I mean, it does, it's not fun to hack and slash the whole time. So, if there happens to be a uh, thunderstorm going on and your sword needs a little extra boom, you can raise it to the heavens, and lightning will strike it, and it will become empowered, with which you can smite down your foes. So, is this, is this project plausible? Absolutely. The tech is there. You, got, you guys, when you come on board to work on this, you're not going to have to worry about any of this. The Oculus Rift should be very simple to integrate once we have it. And our solution right now is, is simply uh, just plug and play. The design offers a little something for everybody. Um, producers will have to worry about the constraints of a mocap studio. How do we make a compelling, challenging game without getting the player exhausted while they're playing it? Because that, that could be a problem. Artists will be uh, We got five really gorgeous environments, but they're all limited in size, by the size of the mocap studio. You'll be able to see beyond it, but you need to keep that ground area pretty much clear. The programmers, you just need to make, bring it all together. You need res responsive enemies and uh, type control for the, for the uh, player's weapons, the collisions, and everything like that. It's all about doing a couple things that no one else has done before really well. And uh, We'll open it up to questions in a second, but before I get there, I want to just reiterate, this is a project that is all about being new. Being new and different. Something that nobody has done before. We spent this entire semester learning to not be afraid of new tech, and I don't think now is the time to start being afraid of it. <coughs> if we make this game, I can guarantee you that in 10 years, you'll be able to look back and this may still have been the coolest thing you've ever done. <clears throat> because this is a game where you literally are the hero. You don't play the hero. You don't hear about the hero. You act and do what the hero does. Everyone you talk to is going to want to hear about nothing but this game. I can promise you that. So, Vinesh and I, we invite you to join us. We want to be the hero. And we want you to be the hero team. Thank you.
something that was and it's been approached since the tennis before with vibrating controllers where you would shoot something and you can see something, you can swing a sword, but when things come back at you or when your sword makes contact with something, there's still gonna be a disconnect because you're not really gonna feel that. And that is a fantastic question. And and yes, we have heard that a lot and we've had a lot of thinking about it. Really, the only the only thing we can do is make sure that the enemies respond immediately and decisively. If, a, if, a, if you strike a bow and if you recoils in pain, you see blood gushing everywhere and there's a great audio feedback of that, we think that's powerful enough, even though the sword won't really meet any resistance. Likewise, if that monster is hitting you, well, well, we can't have someone run up there and push the plate over. <laughs> so we're going to have to make this a little more, atta a little more uh, tactical as well. We're not going to have a monster charge right into you or through you. He's, probably, he's, uh, he's intentionally going to veer off and maybe just glance you with a blade or a ball. Oh. Yeah, um, I, I think it's a, a, an amazing uh, mechanic, and my concern is why you're wearing the headset and you're moving in free space within the mocap studio. What kind of safety precautions can you take uh, as the player will not have any perception of where they are in real time? in reality to the floor. So if they should trip or if they should fall, how can you prevent injury during gameplay? Well, that's a great question. And that is one of the big advantages of the Oculus Rift headset is that it's so responsive and it gives you such a great representation of where you are in the space that we don't anticipate the player will be disoriented or, or really stagger about. Though, if we do find that to be the case, while, while we're testing and once we get this going, we have, a, we have a lot of possible solutions. One, we can just lose a spotter. The mocap studio has enough cameras that we're not going to lose track of somebody if we have someone else there you know, kind of shadowing them and making sure that they don't injure themselves. In terms of possibly you know, leaving the mocap space and running into a wall or something like that, well, level design would be our biggest uh, benefit there as we'll have big, clear barriers that you just know. You know, there's like a tree there. I don't really walk when I walk through that tree, that line of trees. There's a wall, there's, there's a, uh, a cliff. And that'll be really our best indicator for keeping the player within the game area. Okay, good answer, thank you. Yes? But just because you're seeing it, it's not really restricting. So even if I'm seeing the projection of a wall, I can still continue through. <coughs> What's resetting me within that space? It's really not so much as far as the game environment, it's an individual and physical environment. And if anything, I was going to ask, how am I navigating? If anything, it seems you could do it if it was a rail shooter, in which that it's more the world's moving with you as the center, as opposed to, no, I'm actually traversing this area. Okay, uh, if I, I think I understood that right. And re really, the idea with these environments is that, you know, they don't move. You don't really move through the environment, you're just in this very limited space. And we're using the flashback teleports between the tavern and the levels to get to get you back and forth and kind of expand that game area. But it's still just you know, you know very limited scope of the level. Is that, is that what you're getting at? So it's more that I'm positioned within a room. Yes. I then interact with whatever's there, then I put it in the center of another room. Yes. Okay. Yes. Love the idea. I love the ambition. Um, this is more of a logistic question. You're going to be doing a lot of presentations. <laughs> while you're here, weekly status updates and then the big final presentations. How are you going to handle those? Are you going to get people into the mocap room? I have to answer that. Okay. Blade has the ability to stream <laughs> stored data offline. So on my own computer, I have Blade running. I could stream Laura doing her martial arts move, and that's piping into UDK. So what you have, what we have recorded previously will just run off, and it'll still interact like we were in this, uh, the Blade suit, in the mocap suit. Awesome. You know, I, I'm concerned a little bit about this becoming just a tech demo. How do you prevent that? <coughs> Where's your design? You know, besides being in an arena and there's monsters that you're fighting with, with a sword, how do, <coughs> give me some design ideas that make me believe this is more than just a, a tech demo. Okay, excellent question. Well, uh, like I just touched on during the presentation, you have a couple of different resources that we can play with in terms of design. You have your sword, you have your shield, and you have your location in the space. So, for instance, in the uh, in the graveyard level, if, uh, if there are these summoning stones or crystals or what have you that are making these skeletons spawn up, 
you'll be using your sword to hack through them, but you'll also be moving to the location of these items and then using your foot or anything else on your brain in order to kick these objects over. Uh, when you're fighting a boss, there are a lot of different abilities that we could incorporate. You can draw a lot from MMOs like uh, World of Warcraft, uh, simply simple raid attacks. Fire on the ground, that's bad. You, you need to try to move out of it. And we can also use, like with the dragon's fireball, you can be shooting that projectile at you. You have the option to evade it, you can block it. With your sword, there may be a, a special item in the environment where the sword needs to uh, become empowered, either through lightning strike or maybe there's a fire pit that you can stick the sword in and it will light on fire so you can do some damage. Really, the strategy will be fairly simple because we don't want to strain the player too much. They're already in a mocap studio, and that re really is the core part of the game. I'm just I it, it, the, the caution that I'm that I with is is a game that seeks you know that seeks this tech is not a tech game it's not the connect or the we that uh, you know I just the novelty of the of the tech where your game is I, I would do the other way. yes. Do you have any plans if the rift is delayed again? If the rift is delayed again, we will simply have to fall back to the uh, Uzix VR, which we'll be using for testing and iteration on up to April anyway. Do you think that would take away from the experience? Yes, yes it would. If you uh, if you remember from the Oculus trailer, they, uh, they compare themselves in terms of responsiveness and field of view to the other guys. And this piece of tech would represent the other guys. So no, it wouldn't be ideal, but the game would still work. Yes. Oh, the internet wants to know why not use the Connect? Why not use the Connect? Well, the the Connect does not operate with the same level of precision and large space that the MoCap Studio does. We're going to have about uh, 30 by 20 feet of. Uh, 3D space that the player can walk around in, and we're going to be able to track precisely the location of their entire body and uh, and the weapons that they're holding. How many cameras are required? Cameras are required. How many mocap cameras are required? Well, when Blade Two comes out, they can track the same amount of positions with less cameras, but I believe you can get away with that happening. I don't want to say. I don't want to say because I haven't actually gone in front of cameras and blocked out cameras to see which how many it takes before something is lost. Yes, sir. How long do I have to set up to be able to play the game? That depends on how long it takes to uh, get into the mocap suit, get your dots on, and get running. What's the average time? The average time? I believe it's. Uh, to get the cameras online, it could, it could vary anywhere between an hour at most to like 30 minutes in the middle. And that's if you're going in with a new suit and you recalibrating everything. Oh. Um, I guess I was wondering how much uh, marker data did you need? So like, if your shield got in the way of like, the arms and the chest or everything, would you put it under the UK? And then with that being said, like, if, it's, if you don't do it, that's not swear on it. The shirt and the shoes and the data to see what the process The way I'm handling the data in UDK is I'm not ro rotating a bone. I am I have points on their body that's being shifted around. And if I shift this, the rest of the body will move with it. So even if one of the markers go dead, they'll still if your elbow dies. And if you stuck your hand in your arm, it'll still put like this because the physics on the system is pulling your arm with you. And like I said, when Blade 2 comes out with the release, and when we get it, it has a, it's much better at tracking occluded markers. So if you were to like hit the floor and you have chest markers, your chest isn't going to go flying through the board and come back at you. I'm uh, really enthused that you guys use the mocap technology. It's, I mean, it's very cool, you know. Um, <laughs> What do you do to convince those who would think about joining the team? Uh, 
how, how do they take this with them as a portfolio piece? Uh, that is a good question. I think one of the biggest benefits of this project as a portfolio piece is just that it's something so different and so ambitious. <clears throat> and that's really, I, th I think, a great talking point. For the artists, there are some obvi obvious uh, portfolio examples. We're going to need four very high quality, very high resolution models that are going to be doing a lot of moving, animating, and interacting. <coughs> and, uh, for producers, I, th I think it's, inter it's an interesting challenge because there are so many unique constraints that <coughs> the game design has to be built around. If you <coughs> think that maybe, okay, so you do like the, the mocap portion of it, what if you did maybe later port that to the Kinect and maybe it's lesser quality or, or something, you know, so you can take it with you? Is that something you thought about? <laughs> uh, that, that is, uh, if you if you wanted to do that, you would be it would turn into the Star Wars in that game because you couldn't really move that much in your environment and you can't rotate. And when your hand goes behind you, it's lost. So you can't do something fancy like sort of that. It, it, you lose some of the plot, the yeah. but you can right. in fact do that. One thing you can do to offset that a little bit is you can make an array of connects and put like 10 connects around the environment. <laughs> <laughs> and that helps a little bit. That's a lot cheaper than taking a bipods camera. So last I heard, you guys were playing, just goes through, you're planning on presenting the final presentation with somebody in the mocap and you guys displaying on, on the projector, correct? That would, that would be a, a pretty neat uh, final presentation, I think. So yeah. would others get the chance to play it? I mean, obviously, people on the team would, but. Oh, ab absolutely. I think we have uh, quite a few artists who are very interested in getting mocap certified. And once you have that level of confidence, we'll be able to uh, go in, get you set up, and start playing any time once the game's ready. One more question. <coughs> yes. It, it's something that can be done like that, where you can get it up and running and have maybe a couple of things already set up. Mm -hmm. Would you say you could go to maybe 50 bucks and try to achieve the happy DVD and maybe they can act that game? Mm -hmm. as, an, as an attraction, that would probably, probably be one of the uh, few markets for something as ambitious as this using a motion capture studio. Okay. Okay. Thank you.